Uh, I'm Muawiyah Ahmad from Blackburn, studied in Blackburn mainly as well. My father is the principal of our institute in Blackburn, Jamiat al uh, He's been there since over 20 years, 25 years. Uh, before that, he graduated from a seminary in England as well, and then he went abroad and studied there. My grandfather, he's got, uh, he's passed away. Uh, he had two institutes running in India, one for males and one for females, close by, close proximity about 2,000 students in each institute there. Uh, I graduated in 2010, so almost seven years ago. So almost one year after that, uh, in fact, the following year, I started to teach in school uh, maths. So since then, I've been teaching that maths GCSE level. Along with that, the year after that, I also started to teach Islamic studies. In that, I was mostly teaching the early years in the first few years. That's basically Arabic literature, Arabic language, grammar, morphology, etc. Uh, but now I generally teach, along with those books as well, or books related to those subjects, I also teach Usul al Fiqh, Usul al Hadith, Hadith itself, uh, and more advanced Arabic. I don't think I actually have one specific favorite subject, even though if I was pushed, I might just say hadith, usul hadith, hadith related subjects. But I actually enjoy hadith related subjects, fiqh related subjects. I actually believe for a student and a teacher, for a person, scholar, to be a complete scholar, he needs to be good or have a passion for almost all the primary uh, subjects within Islamic uh, studies along with uh, knowing uh, culture and other related things in the external. But in terms of studying, you shouldn't only be good in one subject, you should try to be good, at least good, may not be expert, but at least good level in all the subjects. Overall, obviously, throughout your years, whether it's the studying, studying itself has an impact as well, but generally, outlook of life, meeting different people etc so it's not only the st studying but generally the development of a human throughout five six years uh, that obviously makes a person more critical or think more deeply about things but i would say more than the five six years from oh, uh, the first year to the bukhari year first year to the sixth year so uh, the advan advancement in those six years in terms of thinking i think in the one or two years after that, when I went into teaching, I think it's been advanced much more compared to the six years of studying. Even though in the six years of studying, there was obviously advance, advancement there as well, because not only the studying, but general outlook on life, it makes a person think deeper. Uh, whenever you do A-levels or any, I don't even like to, personally, I don't actually like to divide stuff like Islamic, non-Islamic studies, but just for the understanding of this uh, discussion, the non-Islamic studies, if you want to call it A-levels in maths or whatever, did that help me? I actually think all those subjects help as a human it helps. So whether you're going to go into maths further beyond A-levels or whether you're going to go into biology or chemistry further beyond A-levels, that's, I think, whatever amount you've studied, for example, in this country, as you know, everyone has to do GCSEs of these core subjects. Now, I think that's actually a very good thing. So at least gives them a bit of insight into different, different subjects. Now, a lot of that thinking can help in Islamic studies as well. For example, it's not that of, we can't put it, it's not going to be so easy to put that, oh, this is where biology helped me, this is where chemistry helped me. But just general thinking, it builds your mind. And for example, certain ayat of the Quran you read and you apply it to your biology, uh, lesson, uh, biology lesson or biology knowledge or chemistry knowledge or other knowledge, uh, for example, physics and the universe, and you see certain tafasir, how you can explain it in a different way compared to how many of the earlier tafasir might have explained it. So it expands your brain as well, and especially maths obviously has a quite direct relevance with Islamic studies. Uh, I did actually start open uni degree as well, which I've done one year for, but 
uh, obviously that you can carry on doing whilst you're teaching, but I think in the second year or third year, it became a bit too much with the teaching, so I had to pause that. I think this is a million dollar question where basically everyone's asking this question. So many people are academics are actually talking about this question as well. But the first thing we need to agree upon is what is the Dars in Islami syllabus? So what do we mean by Dars in Islami syllabus? If you're talking about the Dars in Islami which came out of the earlier people, the, the books that they used to teach, the they, they used to teach, I don't think in England many people teach it like that. I can't speak for the rest of the world currently. But in England, for example, the institute that I come from, if you look at the syllabus and the books taught there, they're very different, or at least quite a few, certain books will remain the same. But a lot of the books, they're very different to what the actual Dars Nidami, or even 50 years ago in Asian lands, the books that they used to teach is very different to what we teach now as well. And I think more than the books that you teach, it's more the way it's taught. So for example, let's just say, Obviously, this, everyone will have their opinion on this as well, but let's just say something like Mantic logic. So how do we teach it? Do we teach it how it used to be taught 50 years ago in the Asian lands, or do we teach it differently? Do we even teach it, etc.? So I think it's, the way we teach it is very different to how it's taught in other places. Whether it's for the good, or whether it's for the bad, or whether it's irrelevant, that's a side question. But I think Dara Sinidami itself, if you want to call it the, the syllabus that's taught in the UK Madaris, whether you can call that Dara Sinidami, but that syllabus, I think it still plays an active role for a lot of people currently. If you ask me 10, 20, 30 years later, I don't know. But obviously, currently, we believe that it will still be very useful for people 10, 20, 30 years later. Maybe, as we've already altered from even 10 years ago how we used to teach, or the books we used to teach, maybe 10 years later. In fact, I've seen many syllabus across the country that they've actually tweaked their syllabus uh, including certain subjects, uh, removing certain subjects. So I think it's a constant process. You have to be on top of it. Just make sure you know what's relevant to the time and keep staying on top of it. Making sure you teach the core, core books or core, core material. That's actually a very, very, very important, I think a very relevant question. That should we teach in the Urdu language? Persian language, English language, what language should we teach in? Firstly, I actually think there's a major shift in the last 10 years. For example, I can remember when we, when we were studying, or I think almost every subject we learned was in the Urdu language, through the Urdu medium. So we learned Arabic through the Urdu medium. But maybe then, even someone may object to then as well, but maybe then it was okay. But now, in the same institute, 10 years later, 7, 8 years later, a lot of the books in the earlier years, especially the grammar, the picking up of the Arabic language, so all those kind of books, logic, a lot of those books which require thinking, a lot of those books are actually taught in English. So now the teaching medium is English, so it's directly, you gain direct access to Arabic through the English language. Uh, so I think there has actually been a shift anyway. So that question soon may be outdated in the sense that Urdu is not taught throughout the syllabus. It may still be taught in certain subjects and obviously should we still teach Hadith for example in Urdu? A lot of places don't. But personally I believe if students, if you can manage that in the first two three years teach them in English but along with that build their Urdu, build their Persian, I'm a person who believes teach them as many languages as possible. So if you've taught them, like for myself, I regret that I don't know Persian. And because of that, I don't have access to many of the books that I, may, would, have, uh, I would have had if I knew Persian. So as long as it's possible, keep them attracted to the English, Urdu language as well, because they are still very good, especially Urdu commentaries of Hadith and Tafasir, etc., which students can benefit from late in their years and late in their life, like Persian has as well. So as much as possible, try to continue making them learn the Urdu language as well. But it shouldn't be at the expense of their learning Islam and Arabic. So it shouldn't be because they're learning Urdu, they unfortunately never understood the Arabic because they were learning Arabic through Urdu. No, teach the Arabic through the English. And on the side, teach the Urdu language. So hopefully by the time they go to the high years, they can understand or have direct access to the Urdu books as well. Uh, 
again, that comes to each individual teacher. So one in the same institute, you could get two teachers, maybe even teaching the same book if it's two different classes. One teacher might be teaching the subject, one teacher might be teaching the book. But, so I, I think it's more than an institute, you should probably direct that question to each teacher. Uh, but along with that, sometimes you also have to, I've seen both scenarios, and I've probably experienced myself both scenarios, where sometimes you try to teach the subject itself. You've taught the subject. Now you look at the result at the end, and sometimes what happens is a lot of the students will have surface knowledge when you just teach the subject. Uh, maybe if you introduce English books, they'll be able to uh, refer back to the English books, but they'll obviously ultimately in an Arabic Islamic studies course, you want to eventually get them to the Arabic books so they can study the Arabic books properly because all the English books are trying to get it from the Arabic books as well. That's the original source. So sometimes when you just teach the subject, it's very important to teach the subject. But I think the right balance between teaching a subject and a book needs to be met. Because sometimes just teaching a subject can just be a few uh, surface knowledge. Whereas teaching a book line by line, word by word, letter by letter, if you teach it and you've unexplained it thoroughly, and the students have engaged with it, sometimes what can happen with book teaching is the students become, uh, they get bored from that, they disengage from it. But if the students remain engaged with the book and with the teacher, then if they learn every, they've understood the reasons behind the book, reasons behind each text, I, th I actually think that's very useful, but I think the best would be a balance in between. Where at the end, your aim is they can solve books as well, meaning they themselves can go to the direct sources and take out the rulings, take out the, understand those books directly, along with have the overall knowledge of the subject as well. So I think balance would be in between. It's probably hard to manage, but I think that's the perfect way to get it. It's hard to put it down to one piece of advice. I think, I would say student by student, it would be different. Obviously, we always give the advice of sincerity. So that's above everything. You do everything for the right reason. So I think that's the one, if I was to say one advice, sincerity, a dua, but more related, directly related to education is when you study, that free time of studying very rarely comes back after. Do you know when you're in your free time of you've got six years just to study with your books, take, make use of that time. Go to the library, read, start reading. In the, if you don't read in that time, to read afterwards will be very hard. Whether it's a student, whether it's not a student, the first and most important thing you want from any human is good manners. Because obviously in hadith comes the thing that's most relevant or most weighty in the hereafter is the good manners. So obviously, Sometimes what happens is when you get a lot of knowledge, the arrogance also comes with it. So one of the main uh, challenges for a teacher or for an institute is that as the student's education uh, increases, and it should increase, you should always try to increase the student's knowledge. There should be, the sky should be the limit, so try to increase it as much as possible. But along with that, make sure you keep them intact, meaning remind them of where our beginning was, and what the purpose of the knowledge is, etc. So I think main thing is the manners has to remain throughout your life. The knowledge, it's meant to increase your manners, not decrease your manners. So I actually don't like to give preference to one, but if, for student purposes, if I was to say, if you finished one book of Nahua, cover to cover, then your Nahua would be very, very, very good. I would probably say, Jamir al Durus al Arabiya. I think that book is very good cover to cover. It's decent size as well. One very good book, but it's very detailed. Nadratun Na'im. One of the places that I've been to myself, and I think more people should visit just so that we understand what leaving the religion or not paying enough attention to religion can do, is southern Spain. So if you go to South, uh, South Spain, you opened your eyes towards that once it was like this, now it's like this. So you realize as well that when you're practicing religion, you need to make sure you're doing it in the right way. You make sure you uh, stay on top of your next generation as well, or else the religion can be lost very easily. So it opens your eyes there. Uh, 
as a United fan, Mourinho? Probably AJ. Many would put the Bruyne, but I think Silva, the Silva is probably. All of them have their unique. Uh, personally, not that I would sit down and follow one, but I think the intensity in test matches, that's... Flintoff, based on he's already passed. I would say half of the Nehajar, Sheikhul Islam and Taymiya. Probably I would say the third one is half of the Nekathir. Move to Turkey, Sheikh Yus, and number three from the teachers, my father. I think overall in life, there's two, three things that a person needs most. Number one, sincerity. I think I've already mentioned in the interview. Number one, sincerity, and number two, manners. So I think I just mentioned two hadith regarding that. Number one, in the Amal bin Niyad, obviously it's a longer hadith, but the core part that sincerity or intentions is very important. A lot of times people do a lot of things and we always start having discussions and debates, especially young students, we start discussing and debating those things. Whereas if you go to that person, sit down with him and understand what was his sincerity, what was his thinking behind it, then you'll notice that he was actually, he had a reasoning for it. He was, between him and Allah, it was actually a very good reason. Obviously, along with that, for a student, it's also important to have correct knowledge. So sincerity, knowledge, but that knowledge has to be coupled with akhlaq as well. As Rasulullah Muslim mentioned, that the best from amongst you is from, the best from amongst you, إِنَّ مِنْ خِيَارِكُمْ أَحْسَنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا So the best from amongst you is the one that has the best of manners.